My name is Alana Spurugusik. I am a professor of chemistry at Harvard University. I've been there for 12 years. And one of my passions is try to figure out how to accelerate the discovery of materials to try to find uh, new renewable energy solutions. Today, uh, I just want to begin by reminding you that this century is very special. We're facing several challenges that range from climate change to the rise of my antibiotic resistant bacteria. And um, to actually address all of those challenges, uh, we're going to need chemistry and we're going to need material science. If you actually Google 21st century challenges, you will find out there is a 21st century challenges website, okay? And if you look at the 32 listed challenges, at least these ones have to do something with molecules and materials. So how, how can we actually use science as technology uh, to, to address these, these, these challenges quickly? So first of all, let me just try to give you a dimension of the problem. So if you look out there in outer space and trying to count how many atoms are in the visible universe. So you just look at, you know, in a, very, uh, in a very dark night and look outside and see, okay, how many atoms are out there? This turns out it's actually 10 to the 82 atoms, okay? So 10 with 82 zeros, okay? So now let's think about, that's kind of like space exploration. I'm gonna make analogies with space exploration. Now let's think about another space that we seldom think about, but that I really care about and many chemists think about, and it's called chemical space. So this space is a little bit different. Instead of thinking about just the total number of atoms, what we're gonna think about is of the atoms that we have in the periodic table, if we were to arrange them into different molecules and materials, and made an assumption that maybe it will take me about six months of work of a human in a room, locked up, trying to make a material, how many materials could we make? So this is a very combinatorial problem. You just imagine a room full of Legos, and you wanna put all the Legos together in different ways. So that's kind of chemistry and material science. And turns out the number of possible molecules and materials is actually comparable to the number of uh, uh, atoms in the entire universe, okay? So it's huge, okay? Depending on the estimates from different papers, it's between 10 to the 60 and 10 to the 180. So if we want to go there and like to try to find these solutions, it's gonna take us a while. Exploring that space is challenging. And to solve the problems that we have, for example, try to address uh, the technological issues related to climate change. Of course, I'm not even talking about the social issues and the political issues and other issues that actually have to be there in place as well. We need an unprecedented speed of exploration of chemical space, and that's kind of what I think about all the time. Okay, so the long-term goal is to map this space and think about how is it organized in terms of functionality. Let's keep thinking about it in terms of this analogy with the stars, and each material may be like a little star. Are materials that are good for something clustered around in a, in a galaxy, or are they just scattered all around and you know, very, very, very hard to find? And also, can I actually organize this space in terms of reactivity? Uh, if you think about materials and, and molecules, one of the most important challenges is degradation. Just think about the plastics in your car after a long time. They start be looking brittle and, and, and crappy, and that's when you go and buy a new car. Right? Those, that type of degradation by light and by oxidation, et cetera, is a big problem for any material that you want to create. So if you organize a chemical space in terms of reaction pathways, you can actually think about how to make the materials, but also how do they degrade. And also, even if we have all of this, perhaps computational power to explore this space, we still need to think about how to do the experiments quickly. Chemical laboratories have not changed since the 16th century, if you look at a photo of a chemical laboratory, you will see uh, a person shaking some chemical and like, you know, putting in somewhere, right? And the, the tools change, but you still have this idea that a human is the one is driving the whole process. And that's why I told you it takes about six months to actually make a molecule, think about that. So how do we test them? I'm gonna use two tools to actually screen for materials. I'm gonna use quantum mechanics and I'm gonna use machine learning. And, why, and, and I'm gonna try to ask myself questions like, this is a molecule I found on the internet. How good is this molecule as a light emission material, for example? Okay. And the, the question I, I want to ask myself is why quantum mechanics? Well, matter is quantum mechanical. Samuel F. Boyce, this guy here that I didn't just put there because he looks a little bit like me, was the guy that did the first quantum chemistry calculation in, a, in an automated fashion for any molecule. In 1955, this is the EDSAC computer in England. And he wrote this beautiful quote that actually I like to revisit many times in my life. He said, I'm going to actually have a computer program where there's a chemical question on one side and a chemical answer on the other. And in 1959, the Boulder, Colorado conference, this sounded like a very weird thing, but turned out to be the mission of my field 
His student, John Popple, got the Nobel Prize. I believe he should have gotten the Nobel Prize. He was still alive when, when, uh, when John got the Nobel Prize, so they should have given it to him. Uh, there's another quote about machine learning. Machine learning is going to be very important for me and my groups and any other people about thinking about materials. Uh, this is a quote by Bill Gates that says, a breakthrough in machine learning will be worth 10 Microsofts. I am pretty sure that's actually true as well. Like, uh, companies that, that use machine learning, like Microsoft itself or Google or IBM, are actually spending a lot of resources and getting a lot of uh, um, income from, from machine learning. And this is just the beginning of the revolution in that field. So now let's just think about material. So is it a cornucopia, right, like a horn of abundance? Like you just you reach in and find a material and you find this material is going to be better for, for a solar cell or for a battery or for, you know, a fusion reactor, right? Is that the case? Like do we have so many 10 to the 60 or 10 to the 180 materials and I just need to grab my hand there and pick one? Turns out it's the opposite. Turns out that most of the materials are not useful for the property that you want. They're going to be very unstable. They're going to be very expensive to make. And they're going to have certain undesirable properties. So we really need to think about a funnel of discovery, right? And, and that funnel, this is a figure for one of our papers, usually starts with layers that have different level of complexity. The first one over there is, is machine learning, then quantum chemistry, then the human brain, and then experimentation. And eventually you will pick out a molecule that is good for the purpose that you want. So that kind of funnel uh, has this challenge, right? Because we cannot even compute the 10 to the 60 possible molecules we will require a computer about the size of the universe, right, to actually compute all the possible molecules. Uh, so we need to use our brain and actually reduce the chemical space to libraries that are easy to search in the computer. And nowadays, at Harvard Supercomputer, I can run about uh, 100,000 molecules uh, in any given project. We'll come back to how can we do even more than that, okay? So we go to an initial library, we use computational screenings, and then reduce that uh, to the synthesis and testing, in most of the projects that I'm involved, there's only about 40 or so molecules that are synthesized and tested to actually um, see if our predictions were correct or not. And in some cases, we have actually gotten success stories in some others, well, we're still working on that. This is in the larger context of the country. Uh, in the past administration, uh, through administration, uh, there was an effort uh, in, started by, 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 by the Obama administration uh, to try to harness the strengths of our country, which are, uh, um, for example, computational tools, data, and experiment, and try to put them together to actually uh, build what, what was called the materials genome. Basically, an idea of actually cataloging and exploring and understanding chemical space. So this is a national effort. There's many people thinking about different types of materials. And, and you know, it, even, even in the current era, we're still working on that uh, against all odds. So materials are key for energy technology, okay? If you want to think about the lowering of the cost of solar, a lot of it has to do with improvement of materials over time. Uh, for wind power, we really need to have lightweight, durable materials. Uh, uh, there's a huge frontier, for example, about carbon sequestration, carbon storage. We could have, for example, high temperature superconductors one day revolutionize power transmission, etc. And today I decided to speak two vignettes which I work on uh, related to solar energy and, and batteries. Okay? But maybe we'll come back to other materials. So let's just begin by organic solar cells. This is a topic that fascinated me uh, more than 10 years ago when I started, when I joined Harvard University. Uh, organic solar cells have the promise of actually having these lightweight, flexible materials that actually are processed at room temperature rather than at very high temperatures that silicon is produced. So you could imagine taking oil, having a few chemical processes, build this polymer, and have this like solar drapes or solar uh, coatings for windows, etc., Or even better, a bag that charges your iPhone. That's, that's a fantastic technology I really need uh, all the time. So uh, this is kind of like the first world view of, of organic solar cells. I'm more interested in the developing population. Uh, you know, there's more than one billion people in the world that have no regular access to electricity. Just think about that, OK? You take electricity for granted, but there's a billion people that do not have access to electricity. And for them, organic solar is actually extremely useful. This is a video from Sheila Kennedy from MIT uh, that uh, she and I talk a lot about this, this type of idea. This is, for example, a village in Mexico with this prototype organic solar cells. Uh, and you can see that you cannot install, perhaps, there a very nice silicon uh, solar cell in that roof. But these first few watts can allow you to actually 
at night, run an organic light emitting diode for reading, for example. This we show ladies actually they're reading. And um, in general, transform the way uh, people live uh, when you're making one or two dollars a day. For example, you could imagine making solar ponchos. I'm from Mexico, so that would be kind of nice too. Uh, or you could imagine, um, um, for example, a person that charges their phone using one of these devices, which is gonna be the next, the next vignette, okay? So this is what uh, this, uh, Sheila, an architect in MIT, envisions as how to, you know, have the human interaction with these new materials. So this is an example where materials could actually really make a difference. Now let's enter a solar cell, okay? So this is a very thin film material where electrons and holes are created by light generating excitations in this polymer. This is an animation that one of my undergraduate students made. This is not real simulation, but this is just a beautiful animation just to imagine how it looks like. We have this disordered polymer system where the electron and hole get together. And then, and this fullerene molecule that is rotated just for dramatic purposes is gonna accept the electron and leave the hole behind in the polymer, okay? When light generates these electron hole pairs and the electron goes to one side and the hole to the other, you close the circuit and generate electricity. So there's many challenges to make a solar cell out of plastic. Notice how messy is that simulation cell. That's a real simulation cell of Jenny Nelson at, uh, at Imperial College in the UK. And this is roughly how the material looks like. 100 nanometers of a plastic blend. You have a transparent oxide in the top and aluminum like a mirror and also electrode in the bottom. And that was basically the material that made the little flexible solar cell. And when I started thinking about this, there were not too many materials that actually satisfied all the requirements. They had to be inexpensive, they had to be long-lived, and they had to be highly functional, okay? And uh, also, the morphology of how they arrange themselves is a challenge. So all of these physical processes that are listed there are very important, and we try to think about and concentrate on what is the right molecule that will be necessary but not necessarily sufficient for this to work. Okay. For that, basically, we need to think about so-called quantum mechanical energy levels, so-called highest occupied molecular orbital and lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. These are two quantum mechanical levels of the molecule. Okay. And I know this is a diverse audience, so I'm just going to tell you that there's not too many molecules that have the HOMO at the right level, so it's not oxidized by oxygen, or the LUMO at the right level to actually transfer the electron to the full energy, Okay. So we need to think about what is the right HOMO and LUMO. And this is where we can actually accelerate and turbocharge Matthias' discovery. And all of you can help. And how can you help, okay? How can you sitting back there, you can connect to a website and actually start helping us tomorrow, okay? So we started a project back then in 2006 and ended in 2017 uh, in collaboration with IBM. The IBM World Community Grid uh, team is here, actually in the front. They have been my partners. I just met a few of them uh, just right now for the first time, although we have had phone calls every two weeks. Um, and what we did is the largest ever quantum chemistry screening project to date. We ran more than 300 million density functional theory calculations, these quantum mechanical calculations, using much more than 30,000 CPU years. That's if you turn on a computer back then when there were uh, mammoths roaming around in the earth and let, let it running, okay? We were able to do that uh, by actually distributing this computer program that actually has a beautiful screensaver. So when you actually stop checking Facebook and go get a coffee and come back, your computer is actually helping us calculate one of these materials, okay? So uh, you can think about it like this. We generated, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of these, uh, collaboration with IBM, and people around the world were actually using their computers to actually pick one of them, and in about 12 hours, they carried out one of the quantum chemistry calculations, right? send the data back to the IBM servers. We came back to Harvard where we did machine learning and quantum chemistry, tried to understand how this works. And, um, and maybe this person has the right molecule or maybe this other person has the right molecule, right? But you know, suddenly this became a collective effort. So society is now involved in science, which is something very important. You can have your 12 year old actually connect and download this thing and actually count how many molecules they have done. They actually get budgets. I'm addicted to the Pokemon like uh, levels in my phone. It's the same thing. You get these badges, that, you know. Um, and I believe that this type of projects, there's many of them in the World Community Grid. And our phase, this phase ended. We're working with them, perhaps, on doing a next phase uh, that hopefully works out soon, where we will announce more. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I just want to say one word to you. Just. One word. Yes, sir. 
Are you listening? Yes, I am. Plastics. Okay, so that's the word, plastics. Okay, so join the World Community Grid. I downloaded just before this talk, notice the time, 12.06, this talk is at 1. 750,000 members almost, 4 million devices, 1.5 million CPU years of people donating computer time, building the world's delocalized supercomputer. Okay, so there's no excuse. People that are sitting here should go home and download the, the World Community Grid. It's actually really fun. Um, so remember those Homo Lumo levels. There is this a map, okay, that has the efficiency of a solar cell. 10% is that little top corner over there. I'm not going to explain the scientific axis, although I'm a scientist. That's just a way of arranging the Homo and the Lumo. The band gap is the difference between the Homo and the Lumo. Okay, sorry, you see, I had to explain it. I'm a scientist. So anyway, uh, if you go to that particular region, you will find these 10% efficient organic solar cells. So what do we do for the Clean Energy Project? Very early on, we built this library that built about 3 million molecules out of these 26 building blocks. And we searched that space, and that's actually a computational map of chemical space that has the log of the number of molecules calculated with quantum mechanics in those hexagons. And the region over there is a region of 10% solar, solar cells, okay? 10% means that you convert one every 10 photons that hit the solar cell into electricity, which is pretty good for this messy plastic material, okay? And that's about 1.5% of the space, so it's a very good lottery, much better than the public lottery. If you download the computer, one every 100 or so of the molecules you are computing, you will be helping us, okay? So that's, you know, you will be helping, and some of them will be crappy, but, you know. But things have, things have actually uh, looked pretty good. For example, during the project, we were able to actually use the computer to predict this molecule, predict this molecular crystal, and then my collaborator, Shannon Bao, made it. And this molecular crystal allows us to actually m make um, a crystalline type of material that could be used in solar cells. And at the moment, we had the record of the highest hole mobility. That means that we're moving holes, you know, electro electric absence of electrons, at the same speed as amorphous silicon in a plastic. Okay, and this was designed by a computer. Um, what we're doing, uh, what we did in the last few years of the Clean Energy Project is completely enter the field of machine learning. And I have just full talks about the stuff that we're doing in machine learning. Today I'm just going to tell you that what machine learning allows you to do right now is not waste that 99% of the computer time. Now the screensaver or the distributed computing system can be used only to verify the predictions that we made of machine learning, increasing the throughput by a factor of 100, okay? So that's an example of what you can do with machine learning. So let me go to another vignette uh, about, uh, about batteries, and then I wanna come back to talk about robots, okay? So we wanna talk about batteries, and then we wanna talk about robots and the future of Matthias' discovery, okay? So my group at the same time was thinking about, well, we have solar energy generation, but there's also the issue of solar energy storage. If we really want to have a renewable energy transformation, we actually have to think about how to store the energy that we generate. At a certain point, if, you are, uh, if you're in a grid, you're going to have to balance solar with, for example, coal or something if you don't have the ability to store energy. And humanity has never, ever stored energy at a massive scale. So we, need, we started a, a, a quest for what is gonna be the cheapest molecule out there in chemical space that could store electrons that we generated with our organic solar cell. Our vision will we is like, a, like a, a distributed energy network where everybody has a little tank full of our chemicals and a little drape of solar, uh, of solar curtains, right? And then at night when there's no electricity, you could store the electricity in your, in your own little uh, energy storage, but also you can imagine this vision much more grid scale. You can have these wind farms with these uh, chemical tanks, okay? So here is a real president talking about uh, energy storage. Uh, as a company that provides multi-megawatt energy storage solutions uh, using, and I have no idea what this is, vanadium redox fuel cells. That's one of the coolest things I've ever said out loud. I miss him a lot. Uh, so uh, he is amazing. I mean, he's talking about vanadium redox flow batteries, okay? There is an issue with the vanadium, vanadium flow battery, okay? There's not enough vanadium in the world, in the entire cross, to store all the energy that we need, okay? So we need to find replacements. So we need to think outside of the box. We cannot use metals necessarily. There's a lot of also security issues with metals. We potentially could use iron. Um, um, 
or other, or other metals, but what we were thinking about is how about molecules, right? After all, our body has molecules. So in 2014, in collaboration with other researchers at Harvard that I will tell you about, uh, we came up with this idea of organic flow batteries. Our energy storage efforts has led... That was the only uh, appearance of all the computational in the, in the entire four minute video, so. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's us in our, in our Blackboard, you know, mimicking our discovery process. Uh, so let me tell you what is a flow battery. Wind turbines and solar panels are great sources of clean energy. But what happens if it's calm or cloudy? Flow batteries store power in liquid tanks. The bigger the tanks, the more energy they can store. Here's how they work. Two solutions, one negative, one positive, are pumped into the battery. The energy source charges the battery, pulling electrons from the positive solution, a process called oxidation, and pushing them into the negative solution, a process called reduction. When the battery turns on, the electron flow reverses, and it generates an electric current. Using non-toxic organic chemistry, Harvard researchers are building safer, cheaper flow batteries, moving us one step closer to a bright future lit by clean energy. This video always makes me feel good after I listen to it. Uh, so one of the things that is interesting here, many things were said in that video, is that we're using water, for example, as our solvent. We believe, you know, water is very cheapest possible solvent. You don't want to have something flammable like the solvent that is used in your lithium ion batteries in your basement, right? So if you buy one of these Tesla batteries, I really like Elon Musk, but you have to be a little bit careful about having that thing in your basement, in my opinion. So I prefer our technology, which is water. Uh, um, and the other thing, the other thing that, that um, is also interesting is that we're very interested in toxicity. We want you to be able to mop, you know, that thing and just like, don't worry about it if there's some leak, okay? So uh, this is how this flow batteries looks like. This is a company that went under because they were using metals for flow batteries, but that's a real demo scale flow battery next to a solar panel. And I think this is gonna be the future of energy, right? Two tanks with catalyte, uranolite, two different chemicals, store the energy from the solar panels and hopefully those solar panels one day will be organic as well. So we opened a textbook of organic molecules, again, chemical space is huge, and we found quinones. How many of you know anything about quinones? Oh, there's one person in the back, that's amazing. So let me tell you about the quinones. Uh, quinones are used in our body to actually shuttle electrons. That's what we think, thought about it as a, as a possible chemical uh, that we could employ. Okay, so there are electron shuttles in plants. Quinones are also laxatives and antibacterials, and they're also used in your rhubarb cakes, okay? And they're also dyes, like my gene dyes, okay? And finally, if you really wanna attract female cockroaches, you can actually douse yourself with Blatella quinone, okay? That quinone variant. Okay, so they are abundant everywhere. You can actually synthesize them from oil. They're industrially scalable. So we thought, quinones were actually a good target. And at Harvard, in 1922, Louis Fischer, already said that quinones were very different than aldehydes, ketones, nitriles, etc. So even in 1922, one of my former colleagues that I never met, of course, but he was also bald. Notice my, my obsession with putting pictures of bald men on the, on the internet. Uh, so one of the things is we need multidisciplinary teams, okay? You cannot just be a scientist in your room, like that doesn't happen anymore. Now we have to have collaborations, okay? So this collaboration actually involved Mike Aziz, which is an engineer, Roy Gordon, which is an experimental chemist, and me, that I'm a theoretical chemist. And that's a demo of our little Harvard flow battery. At the time, of course, it's a demo. The technology has been licensed. Uh, we keep working. This, this is the paper on generation one. We have generation four or five already. And the way it started, it was like a micro clean energy project, right? Instead of, we, we didn't run it, these molecules in the world community grid. We're changing things so that one day we can run anything we want in the world community grid to be much more agile, right? But at the moment we were stuck with doing solar cell molecules in the world community grid, so we ran this in the Harvard cluster. And only with 10,000 quinone molecules that we designed very carefully the search, we synthesized and tested it, and in this very intense design cycle we found out antraquinone disulfonate, or Jesus Christ quinone as we like to call it, uh, as one of the very, very, very good candidates uh, for organic uh, flow batteries, okay? So even generation one is still very competitive, okay? So that, there it is. Uh, the other pair was bromine in this particular case. We wanted to have a metal-free paper. We're still working a lot in the molecules that go in the other side of the battery, and that's me pretending to be an experimentalist. Uh, so let me show you another thing that is very important. There was a huge overflow in the data science room over there, okay? Like, 
this is data science too. This is database of two million of those flow batteries colored by their stability. And you can go in in our web interface, click on the molecule and find out if the molecule is good or bad for energy storage. So there's a lot of data science and machine learning that is needed to actually go ahead and help the experimentalists find the molecules. Notice how there's a lot of stable blue molecules on the left-hand side of the plot and very unstable red molecules on the right-hand side. Turns out the right-hand side is the molecules for the side of the battery we're having trouble finding. So one of the very interesting negative results that we found is it's going to be very hard to use quinones for that particular side of the battery. Do we worry? We don't worry. How many molecules are out there? 10 to the 60 to 180. So we're looking at different families of molecules. We also invented this, this very important uh, uh, concept of the molecular baseball card. So we want to think about ways of visualizing chemical data that is actually very easy to understand. And we like these ideas of the baseball cards. Like, tell me which card you like the most, OK? And uh, this is more or less how our database in an early version looked like. So uh, that's how we were able to handle, for example, about millions. And we have computed more than 2 million organic flow battery molecules to date. Okay? So now, also we use other tools. Uh, I always ask this question. Nobody really wants to confess. How many people use this tool called Tinder? There you go. Some people have Tinder. Yeah, thank you for raising your hand. There's only honest people in this room. It's a very good tool to actually really quickly filter potential mating partners. Okay? And um, that, there it is, Tinder. Uh, so we decided to actually to narrow down the synthesis and characterization of the molecules. This was for another project, by the way, on display molecules. So sorry for jumping into display molecules. I don't have a Tinder for flow batteries. But here is the Tinder for, for uh, display molecules for cell phones. And you can see that we invented a very important Tinder feature called maybe, which is that yellow button over there. Okay? So yes, no, maybe. Okay? That, I think, is missing in Tinder. So uh, they should pay us a royalty. But that's basically the, the, uh, the, the, the tool that allows us to actually narrow down to experimental experimentation. So you have to have an interface with experimentalists so that all your calculations actually get made into molecules. So the new modern way of actually designing materials requires humans, requires computers, neural networks, databases. Uh, might require the world community grid. You might be able to do it in your cluster. and requires a laboratory. Right? So it's more and more like a large-scale project. But if we don't integrate all these pieces, we're going to be doing the chemical laboratory of the 20th century, and we're not going to be able to actually solve the problems that we need, okay? the, the, the problems that we have at hand. So um, we have this code called Molecular Space Shuttle that, again, contains those baseball cards, the boarding interface, detail tables, bubble plots of the performance of the molecules. And um, these kind of tools didn't exist before when, when um, um, Samuel Boyce was thinking about his original tool. He was thinking one molecule, one output. Now we need to think about the entire chemical space and how to design in the chemical space. So this is an example, OK, again, going back to flow batteries, of how a real funnel looks like. I, this is actually a slide from our report to ARPA-E, a fantastic funding agency also created in the Obama administration that is threatened to be destroyed in these budgets. Okay? So you guys have to go and protest these things. Okay? This is an agency that is the equivalent of DARPA for energy. Okay? So ARPA-E funded us because they said, oh, these flow batteries look really cool, and they allowed this public funding, allowed us to actually continue doing this research. Okay? But this is a, a slide that I didn't change. This is just exactly how we showed it to ARPA-E. Okay? Of, the different, of, of different molecules on the right being narrowed down. Okay? And again, I'm not going through the science, even though I really want to tell you everything what's going on, ultimately to have perhaps 84 or so couples. Okay? So once you keep adding some more and more of these layers, then chemical space becomes more and more sparse with the solution that you want. Okay? So I told you we're looking at different classes. What other molecules carry electrons in your body? Have you guys heard of antioxidants? Right? So it turns out that vitamins are very interesting. And in this Nature Energy paper, we built a redox flow battery with aloxacin molecules, which are very similar to vitamin B. Okay? They were inspired by vitamin B. We looked around the space around vitamin B, and we found a vitamin battery. That's why we have this figure that actually looks like little vitamins. So this is just the tip of the iceberg of solutions with organic molecules for our energy needs. Okay? So we talked about two, solar and storage, but there could be others. For example, we're working in my group on plastic coatings for solar cells. There's possibilities that you can have a regular silicon solar cell and coat it with a small little plastic and, and gain 1% or 2% of efficiency by doing a, a, an interesting trick called singlet fission. So uh, the last thing I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to end talking about robots, is that we actually need to think about the entire planet 
Okay? It, this is not going to happen only if we do research in the United States or if we do research in France or if we do research in Germany and we don't talk to each other. So we talked about involving the public. We did that in the World Community Grid. But now we need to involve the international community. Okay? We need to actually all work together and make these international collaborations to solve this problem. And we also need robots. Many people are very scared about robots. They say robots are going to come and take my job. And perhaps it's true for certain types of jobs that those jobs will be displaced and these people will have to be retrained. I am not thinking it's going to be rosy necessarily in all cases. But in the case of science, you know, scientists are very arrogant. I've seen in Twitter many discussions where scientists say there is no way a robot will be better than me at doing organic chemistry. And I'm having this debate with my organic chemistry colleagues. They actually now hate me because I keep saying, no, that's not true. A robot will empower you to do much more organic chemistry and uh, will make you things that, to do that you never imagined you were going to do. For example, think about all the things that you can do with your phone or with your laptop that you could not be able to do before you had that technology. Okay? So we are having actively in the chemistry community this discussion about chemical robotics and where we're going to be. Okay? So that uh, leads me to a story that somebody told me actually I should really tell in this talk. Um, I was driving uh, from Boston to New York um, to give a talk uh, when the Mexican government officials called me. I am Mexican, so they, they, they talk to me a lot. We have a WhatsApp channel where we send each other a bunch of little uh, memes and stuff. But they, they also they called me and they said, Alan, can you actually help Mexico write the proposal for mission innovation? Uh, how many of you know what mission innovation is? Great. This is interesting. It happened to me too. I'm a scientist, okay? I'm like, what the heck is mission innovation? Turns out mission innovation uh, also proposed by the Obama administration. It's an international effort of 22 countries in the European Union formed under the Paris Agreement to double the clean energy research budget in the planet. And the goal of doubling the clean energy research project in the planet is to help us scientists help the world find new materials, new solar cells, new installations of different energy technologies. Okay? So a few months after this was announced, okay, and we were still during that administration, it was October or November, there was a meeting in London where each country was proposing a project, and so I actually helped Mexico write this project. So I called Mexico and I said, are you guys okay? Like, what do you want? Because, you know, is it carbon sequestration, or what do you guys want? Can I write about what I really think is going to change the planet? And they said, sure. So I wrote about something called Materials Acceleration Platforms, and it became one of the seven world projects. It became Innovation Challenge 6. Okay? And what is the idea of Innovation Challenge 6 of Mission Innovation? That, what you see over there, and perhaps the font is too small, is the traditional design process of a material. It takes about 10 years and $10 million to take a material to market, roughly, give or take. Because you intuit a molecule, maybe you can calculate something, you make it in the device, you know, make it in the laboratory, maybe two or three or five or 10, fabricate devices, test, you, you fail, you come back, iterate, eventually scale and manufacture, and that's about 10 years. Okay, for a material to actually make it into a device. For example, Universal Display Corporation patented and started developing the technology for organic light emitting diodes in the 80s. And organic light emitting diodes actually just started appearing in cell phones in the 2000s. Okay, so it's 20 years of R&D to take a technology that was discovered in the 80s into cell phones. Okay, so what we said is, well, we learned in our collaboration with the World Community Grid that you can do a lot by generating libraries using quantum chemistry and machine learning and accelerate the discovery of candidates. And we gave the candidates to experimentalists and then tumbleweed in the desert. You have to wait for the experimentalists to make the material. So now the bottleneck is not necessarily guessing what is going to be the new molecule in all cases. It's how you make it, how you fabricate it. So what we propose for the Innovation Challenge 6 is to actually now focus our efforts into the last part of this pipeline, robotize the synthesis, the fabrication, and the testing of the materials, we're having goals uh, in the laboratory that I'm going to build in, in, in my research group. I, I got 100 square meters to build a new laboratory. We're gonna, our, our stretch goal is to have 1,000 molecules synthesized a week, right? 50,000 a year, instead of 40 over three years, as, as I did with my project for organic light emitting diodes with Samsung, right? So this is something about throughput that we need to actually address now. And there are chemical robots in pharma, but they have not really been employed very much in the material space. So if you want to know more about mission innovation, go to this website, Google it, and see all the other six projects, and see how the world actually cares about energy, and uh, we work together. And of course, the idea is that now that the design loop is actually pushed more and more and more 
towards the testing of devices and now scaling and, and manufacture will only scale the best devices. And hopefully this allows us to actually uh, improve. So I like to call this platform science. Now we need to really integrate these multidisciplinary collaborations. And I told you that we had an engineer, a chemical engineer, and we had a, a synthetic chemist and a theoretical chemist. Now we need a machine learning expert. We need a robotics expert, right? And we need them all together in the same place. So it's kind of like a Manhattan project for each one of the different projects that we need. So I, wrote this, I did this little circle, right, that expands the material genome and I like to call this challenge as ro robot simulation, synthesis, et cetera. So that's kind of like the new vision, I think, seven years later. My conclusion is that now we really need to do this. And uh, that, this is called, um, one, of, one of the marketing tools that we need to have is how to explain that to the general audience. And I think a very good name for it is self-driving laboratory. Very soon I'll show you an example. We actually have already started doing this. Okay, a laboratory that actually picks the next experiment, continues, of course the human is helping it as well. But you, you go at night and then the laboratory does something overnight and you see what happened in the, in the night. You know? Humans don't work usually at night. They go to the sixth street here. In, you know. uh, so so here, is, here is an example where automation really made something amazing. This is beyond Moore's law, okay? The cost of sequencing a human genome, okay? Just because we had much, much better human genome sequencing technology has come down to less than $1,000, okay? An entire human genome. Before, an entire human genome took $100 million to be synthesized. This is a slide from the NIH, okay? And look in this time span, that was 15 years through the introduction of technology. So that was a real Moore's law for, for genomics. So we need to have a, a Moore's law like this for materials discovery. Okay? So maybe 15 years from now, we're going to be discovering materials so quickly that people would not even imagine that, that this was possible. Okay? So for that, we're going to need Q contributing to projects that they work community grid. We're going to need the, the, the entire international coalition of countries uh, to work together to create projects like Mission Innovation. Um, and we're going to need um, the scientists to really talk to each other and be humble and really try to not just be in their silos. Okay? So we, wrote a, we did a workshop in Mexico City with 55 uh, scientists from around the world plus another 100 participants. We wrote a 100-page report on these Matias acceleration platforms. This report is uh, supported by the United States Department of Energy, by the Mexican Secretary of Energy, and by Canada's National Resources Canada. So it's like a North American report. And in there, we're saying that synthesis characterization and computation has to have this really quick loop, right? These materials acceleration platforms. So one has to walk the talk. So I just published a paper on ChemOS, the operating system for the chemical laboratory. So now my students, instead of running code for actually calculating molecules, were shifted, and they're excited because we're building little robots in my laboratory to actually do chemistry. The first robot that we built I don't have photos of it in here, but it's called Margaritor. It's in the paper that you can download from my website. Margaritor Bob the Bot, magician optimized bartender. Because we didn't have a chemical laboratory, we decided to explore with alcoholic drinks. It's, it's poor us. So we started making drinks with a robot and using the robot to actually optimize drinks. You had to give them a, a score. And we found interesting things. For example, the best margarita contains 10% vinegar. Turns out that we put vinegar as a negative reagent there. We thought nobody was going to like vinegar. But if you add 10% of vinegar to margarita, people seem to like it more. This is a very preliminary result. We need to do more testing before we publish such a discovery that might make me rich. Okay? <laughs> so when you go to the bar right now in 6th Street, ask them to put 10% vinegar on your margarita and say that this Harvard professor told you that was better than regular margarita. Let's see what face they say. They say Mexican Harvard professor. They will be, believe it even less. Okay. So, so here's a robot, the characterization software on the fly, and the machine learning algorithm. This is what we like to call a meta lab, because the software is run at Harvard, but the robot is in Vancouver. Okay? So this is the, 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 the machine of my friend Jason Hine. There's the machine, and this is our software, ChemOS. ChemOS optimizes. And the first time we ran this robot, which basically does something quite simple, injects chemicals in a in a, in a column and tries to optimize the, 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 the peak area in, in, in a chromatography column. You will see a hand appear here very soon. Uh, such, a, such a robot in a night got 50% better results than the humans were trying to optimize by hand. First experiment. We were so lucky that the first experiment, our AI-powered robot, so what we do is AI to 
pick what's the next best thing to test. Humans are really bad at picking what's the next best thing, thing to test because they think, they think like, like if in steps. They say, let me add more of this, let me add less of this, let me add this of this. Whereas computers actually optimize in multidimensional space in a very non-intuitive way, try to maximize what's going to be the places where you gain more information about what you don't know and also where to exploit where uh, things are good. And actually, this is a very big topic in machine learning called active learning. Yeah. So this is an example of real things that you can do. And you just have to be kind of uh, open about, about, um, about the kind of things that you want to engage in your laboratory. So now, how are we going to make the computers? So it turns out that people so that make, make the molecules. turns out that people actually have uh, fabricated uh, DNA. So you can actually synthesize DNA with a machine. There's only four molecules, A, C, T, and G. So there are machines that actually make DNA, and then you can polymerize it with PCR and you can have little DNA strands that you can order online. People don't even think about it, but DNA chemistry became robotized. You can just order online from China, from wherever, you're gonna get back your little DNA, okay? The same thing can happen for peptide sequences for proteins. You can just go online, click a button, and you will get a molecule. Why not for the entire chemical space? This is a human sociological issue because organic chemists keep saying that's impossible, number one, and they keep trying to discover reactions that are more and more specific rather than more and more general. But there are some people that see the light, and one of them is Marty Burke at Urbana, that actually is coming. I went to visit him in December. He's coming to Harvard, and he's part of my team of Avengers. I'm trying to come up with a team of Avengers, crazy people around the world. They're going to get together with our superpowers to try to do this, okay? try to make these robots. So now I became an experimentalist. I'm helping him build. He calls this robot the machine. Okay? Not very good marketing, but we're going to try to fix that. But we're going to do the machine 2.0 in collaboration with Marty. And Marty basically uh, has shown in his papers that up to 60 or 70 percent of the natural products, all the molecules that are done, made by plants and, and so on, that you can find in interesting species or bacteria, could be synthesized with about 1,500 1, precursors and a machine like this using his chemistry, which is boron hal halide chemistry. And the most important thing about it is that this is a modular building block chemistry. Rather than thinking about chemistry that is esoteric, you think about chemistry as cartridges, right? You have 1,500 cartridges, like a 3D printer. So I have this vision that in 10 years we'll be there. And not all molecules could be made like this, but we will be able to have these robots that pump out molecules. You will be able to order them online, and we'll democratize chemistry. So think about these high school kids in the basement ordering a, chemi a chemical for online and trying to discover a new chemistry. Okay? So that's the new vision, and we're going to make it happen, not only for, for DNA and proteins, but for the entire chemical space. I think this is the next frontier for, for chemistry. And then another thing that um, appeared yesterday, I was on the plane here, uh, t t basically uh, tailoring this talk, and, and I found this news from MIT. Okay? MIT is working on a new fusion reactor, and I love the way they did it. They did it also uh, as a startup, okay? So they, you, have to, uh, you have to give them a, a lot of credit to say, we're gonna create a fusion power startup because they believe that it's gonna be, a f in 15 years, the possibility of having commercial fusion power, okay? So I told you about solar and batteries. If this is really panning out, this is a game changer, right? Fusion, okay? And these are my colleagues down the road at MIT, okay? That little technical institute down the road from Harvard. Uh, um, <laughs> So uh, those guys uh, say something very interesting. This material was, this was possible because of the discovery of a new high temperature superconducting material that allows them to make their fusion reactor 65 times smaller than the international collaboration called ITER on fusion reactors, okay? So the discovery of a new high temperature superconducting material allows us to have better magnets to actually compress the size of the fusion reactor and perhaps may bring this technology that many people joke is always 15 years in the future, people keep saying that, really now happen. Okay? And, and I'm a big believer that Matthias is going to be key to the solution. I've been talking to many people in the fusion field about this. Uh, for example, degradation of the coatings, etc. But note what they say in their press release. The work made possible by decades of federal government funding for basic research. Okay? So let's keep supporting federal funding for research. Let's not give up. Uh, right now we're in, in what Naomi Klein calls the shock doctrine. 
we're getting inundated with news about uh, porn stars suing the president, uh, all the way down to meetings between the president and Kim Jong-un, and like all sorts of random stuff while they are cutting the budget for everything. Okay, and that's, that's called the chalk doctrine if you want to read the books of Naomi Klein about this. And one of the things that's going to happen is our science for budget is also going to be decimated by these uh, people in the White House. Okay, so we have to fight them. So we need you. Your support in these dark times is very important. Okay, and we're going to fight too, but we need you as well. So I'm going to end with a picture of my research group in the Excited State. Uh, and uh, to thank them all, they did all this work. I'm just traveling around to South by Southwest and giving talks. And they are the ones that are in the lab there all the time doing actually the science. Uh, many of the people here worked in the World Community Grid. Uh, uh, and, um, and let me see where Steven Lopez, which was the last guy that worked with IBM. We call him Stilo. Uh, oh, where's Steven? Well, I don't see Steven. I should have put a box around him. My group is very large. Uh, I don't know. Okay, and then I'm gonna end with this quote. Uh, this quote by, by Steve Jobs is very interesting because if you really wanna design a material, it's gonna be hard and you need to actually take it seriously and the same way he designed apples. And then uh, if you wanna learn more about the World Community Grid, um, there's actually a session called Saving the Planet, what's tech got to do with it? We joined Hindo and others from the World Community Grid uh, in this room on Monday at 11 a.m. So you're invited to come to that session and learn more about other cool projects related to cancer and health and all sorts of different uh, initiatives, including energy, okay, here uh, in, 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 in room six. And with that, I'm gonna end and on open for questions, we still have about 13 minutes for questions. Thank you. Okay, so please come to the microphone and ask questions. Don't be shy. I don't bite. Hi there, that was, that was amazing. Um, I was just curious, uh, I work for an energy company, and so this is one of the challenges that obviously that we're facing is how to make solar energy affordable. So you were talking, you sort of went into that discussion about the silicon panels and everything. Um, right now we're working on putting solar into Chicago area, and it's about $18,000 a home to install the panels and get it going. Uh -huh. That's a very high bar for most families. So what's your thinking on like the, the plastics you were talking about, the silicon, when will that be something that's more commonly available and affordable? Well, let's talk about silicon. So uh, I like to walk the talk, as I told you, I'm building robots. I also install solar panels in my house for more or less about that price. Okay. Uh, turns out, uh, my calculations say you get a, a very good return on investment. So if you end up having that money, putting them in Massachusetts where I live, where we have also a very uh, decent state, state laws, we get, uh, we get some rebates from the state uh, for our solar production, and we also get uh, um, some federal, even federal tax rebates. I don't know if they disappeared in the last tax situation. But in any case, uh, that was a very good thing for me, also the feeling that I don't have to, I have like zero, zero dollars electrical bill, and I'm using the, the sun, right? So it's amazing, in Boston even, where, it's, where there's not too much sun, like in Chicago. It is right, I mean, half of the price of the solar panels is the system, is, is the system cost, and then half is the panel or something like that. Okay, I'm not, I'm not such an engineer, so I don't know the costs to the level that I should. Uh, but, um, so if we, even if, even if we cut down the cost of the materials to zero and we made them out of plastic, the system will be still $9,000, right? And the installation and all that stuff. So we also need to think outside of the box of what does it mean uh, to put a solar panel. That's why I like the idea of solar drapes, and I like the idea of these non-flexible surfaces. You have to also know that we researchers think about the basic science, make all these discoveries, and then leave it to some engineers and others and, and entrepreneurs to actually make it into the, into, the, into the market. So I don't know exactly how the new technologies are gonna pan out. Uh, I'm very excited about our idea of increasing the efficiency by one or 2% of the regular panels with a little plastic coating. So basically for zero cost, I will give you 10% more. So I will lower in the near future with my lab's technology, maybe, 10% uh, of the cost. So instead of the $18,000, I lower it down to 16000 So is that game changing? Well, maybe not, but if you look at the global scale, that's a big change. So I think that's how it's done. Sometimes it's done by revolutionary changes, sometimes by evolutionary changes. And it has to be a, a, a worldwide effort and, and not putting tariffs on solar panels, right? Yeah. Well, that's great. I have a follow-up question, actually, if you 
if you're willing to take one. Sure, more. please, please. So, um, what's your? I, I liked the slide that you shared on Moore's law and the sequencing. What is your view of the impact of Tesla and his experimentation in this field? Tesla, amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I, I was joking about their. I was joking about their battery, lithium battery technology. As uh, we don't have other technologies readily available to scale right now for storage. So the fact that Tesla is actually using that technology that I consider not the final solution to start doing some deployments is actually great. So I, I really admire that they are doing this, this uh, lithium storage units. I believe the future is gonna have chemicals that are more funky like ours, that cost way less per kilogram and that are much more safe. But we don't have our chemicals scaled up yet. So you have to use what you have to use. But Storage is going to be the next frontier for R&D, I think, and also for, for business opportunities. You know, just basically arbitraging the grid when there's a lot of energy production. You know, you can, you can actually store it and then sell it when there's less production. So even making money that way by the minute is an interesting proposition for some people. I, I'm more interested in the, in the developing world applications, but it, we have to pay it for this so, somehow. So that's, that's an example of where you know, battery technology is even commercially available today, important today, like to arbitrage the, you know, the electricity markets. Okay, well, then if there's no more questions, there's somebody wants to make a question in the back, though. No. If there's no more questions, then uh, I'm gonna be around, and if anybody has questions one-on-one, -on -one, please come and talk to me. And thank you for coming to, to this talk, then, okay?